And now uh, this morning, our scripture reading, you may not be able, all of you may not be able to follow it uh, on the monitor, but we apologize for that. Very short reading, St. John chapter 1, verses 29 through 37. This is uh, John the Baptist speaking. The next day he saw Jesus coming toward him and declared, Here is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who ranks ahead of me because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but I came baptizing with water for this reason, that he might be revealed to Israel. And John testified, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. I myself did not know him, but the one who sent me to baptize with water said to me, He on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain is the one who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. I myself have seen and have testified that this is the Son of God. The next day John again was standing with two of his disciples, and as he watched Jesus walk by, he exclaimed, Look, here is the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. This is the Word of God for the people of God. Be to God. Today is, of course, first day of the month and Communion Sunday. And as I mentioned last month, if any of you remember, and I know many of us have slept since then, that we're going to take the first Sunday of each month, not only as communion, but we want to make it special because sometimes we kind of make communion a part of the service at the end and we kind of rush through it. And I believe we're cheating ourselves. That communion is not just an ordinance, an ordinance is something that God has uh, told us that we're supposed to do. In the Protestant uh, traditions, we only have two, baptism and communion of the Lord's Supper. If you were a Catholic, there are seven, and I might remember five off the top of my head, but trust me, there are seven. Um, but uh, baptism, you can only do once, and I know there are many who uh, teach rebaptism and what have you, but you can really only be baptized once for Jesus Christ. Uh, but you can have communion, as John Wesley says, every day if you want. And he would encourage that, by the way. But we want to take the first Sunday of each month and make it um, not just Communion Sunday, but a meaningful time of worship and fellowship because this is one ordinance that Christ has given us, which is himself, as we all know. Amen? And I'm kind of getting ahead of the sermon, but that's okay. John's gospel is very unique in that if you've read Matthew, Mark, and Luke, which most of us have, when you get to John, John doesn't get into his birth or his early days uh, or his uh, uh, baptism or his going out in the wilderness. This first chapter, what I just read for you, picks up after he came back from the wilderness. So now Jesus has went through temptation. He has come back in the power of the Spirit, is what Luke tells us. And now he's ready for ministry, and now he begins to choose his disciples. We're not going to talk about that part this morning, but he's choosing his disciples. And then, of course, we read in verse 37 that when John proclaimed, Behold, there goes the Lamb of God, two of his disciples left him. Uh, what an ego bust. Uh, but that's what happened. And we know that many of the disciples of Jesus were probably disciples of John as well. But as we study the scripture, several things come out to us because this is a peculiar announcement by John. Because nowhere in the scripture is Jesus ever called the Lamb of God. Uh, we read about it in Isaiah 53. We read about uh, Isaiah 53, and the way we read about it is, John, is Isaiah says it this way. Speaking of the Messiah, he was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. And listen to this closely. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter and like a sheep that before its shears is silent, 
so he did not open his mouth. So we have Isaiah telling us that he will be like a sheep, but he didn't call him a sheep, excuse me, a lamb. He said he'll just be like a sheep. His behavior will be like a sheep. And the importance of this is found in the book of Acts, that after Jesus had ascended and the church had begun, then we find an evangelist named Philip that ran into an Ethiopian eunuch in Acts chapter 8. And I wish I had time to get into it. I know sometimes I go off the deep end. Amen? Amen. You know I do. And please don't hold that against me because I love the Word of God. God just speaks to me all through it, and I can follow the chain. And God showed me that years ago. The first few times in my mind I could begin to follow it, it scared me. But now I can see it as I've read Scripture and, under, and, and, have, and have memorized it for years, that now my mind just automatically goes places. And I know I can jump all over the place, but in my mind I see it and it's so exciting. And you may stand there, or excuse me, sit there and go, what's he talking about? He's in his own world. Well, my children will tell you that. Thank you. And uh, so anyway, so in Acts chapter 8, we read of the eunuch is in the desert, and Philip is in the desert. This is a beautiful story. He's in the desert, and the eunuch, if you know the story, was from Candace, the queen of Sheba. And years and years and years before that, the queen of Sheba had met Solomon and uh, was so enthralled because of Solomon's great wisdom, she probably converted to Judaism. And she went back as a converted Jew. So here we have 800 or 900 years later, she is still, her descendants are still sending offerings back to Jerusalem every year. So she sent her trusted eunuch, one of her uh, court officers there to give um, an offering, probably at Passover time. And he's on the way back in this great caravan, and he's reading the Bible or the scripture, the scroll. And he's reading in his chariot, Acts uh, chapter 8, verse 32 tells us that he's reading Isaiah 53. And he's reading out loud, and you've got this weird guy, Philip, walking next to the chariot, listening to him read, and he says, hey, do you understand what you're reading? Now how about, the best way I can explain that today is you're driving down the road in your car mumbling to yourself and a guy's running next to your window. Hey, buddy, you got it? That's the picture. But this man was so, so, so focused on what he was reading, the weirdness didn't hit him. But here's what he was reading, Isaiah, um, from Isaiah 53. Uh, now the passage of the scripture that he was reading was this, like a sheep... He was led to the slaughter, and like a lamb silent before the shear, so he does not open his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation? For his life is taken away from the earth. Now the eunuch turns to Philip, for he doesn't know who this guy is, but he turns to Philip and says, or actually asks him a question. About whom, may I ask, does this prophet say this about himself or about somebody else? In other words, his question was simply, what I am reading here, is this the prophet talking about himself or is he talking about somebody else? And Philip, in verse 35 of Acts 8, began to speak, starting with that scripture. He proclaimed to him the good news about Jesus. Isn't Jesus good news? Amen. Jesus is good news because now we have his portrayal as the Lamb of God. And we know kind of how this uh, plays out because I read the back of the book. How many of you have read the back of the book? Meaning all the way to Genesis to Revelation. We've read the book, haven't we? We've read the back of the book. And we've been preached to, we've accepted the Lord, and we kind of know how it all fits together now. And so we, from hindsight, can look back and see how it all fits. 
we can now see that Jesus became the Lamb of God. That we can now see, as John would tell us, Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. And what is, what is very ironic here is we don't know where John got that from. Because in the Jewish mindset, in their worldview, they weren't looking for a lamb. They were looking for a, a political Messiah. They weren't looking for anyone to come and die for them. They were looking for their Messiah to come and overthrow Rome, and they'll all become the big shots. The priesthood would continue, and the Messiah would be on the throne being the big shot. That is what they were looking for. They weren't looking for a lamb. They weren't looking for baptism. They weren't looking for anything. If you keep that in mind, that is why so many people didn't get it, because he didn't meet the script. They'd been told for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years, they were told over and over and over and over again, this is who the Messiah is going to be. And when Jesus showed up, he wasn't that. So it threw them off. That's why you read so much confusion, so much this, so much doubt. We think he is, but we're not sure. The reason we're not sure is he doesn't follow the script. And the beauty about that is that that tells us several things. First off, God is God. Amen? Amen. And I don't know about you, but he didn't call me last week asking me for help. <laughs> I've never had a phone call from God yet asking me for suggestions. Have you? God is the head. He don't need nobody else. I think of a song right now. He don't need nobody else. He's the great I am. And he'll throw you a curveball, won't he? He'll throw you a curveball, and you won't anticipate it. And this is the curveball. Behold the Lamb of God. Because this all ties in to communion. Because if you hear, Behold the Lamb of God, then your mind, if you remember Sunday school, anybody ever go to Sunday school? Any of you ever made to go to Sunday school? Anybody forced to go to Sunday school? Oh, you all willingly went to Sunday school. Isn't that great? You learn about the Passover and Egypt and Moses and the ten plagues and all that stuff, right? And you learn about what the Passover meant that on us that on the second month, on, a, on the, I think it's the tenth day of the month, you were to get a lamb, you were to make sure it was of the first year, it was a male, it had no spots, no blemish, no nothing, which Peter in the New Testament says, that's going to be the church. He's going to present it as without spot, wrinkle, or blemish. So we're all in, um, actually, if you think of sheep, they do have to shear sheep. Any of you feel like you've been sheared? And so, anyway, so they had to take the lamb, and then they had to kill the lamb, and then they had to eat the lamb. They actually had to roast it. But the exciting part of that story is they were to eat it with their shoes on their feet, with their clothes on, staff in their hand, bags packed, ready to go. Because God was going to do something. How many of you need God to do something? And so, because we have all these things pointing to communion, then we have to recognize that communion is not just something we do first of the month because that's what the church has been doing for 2,000 years. Because communion is not completely symbolic of the Passover, but it has many of the same elements, many of the same connections. So we should expect when we partake in communion, we should be ready that God does something for us. That it's not just we eat, but there's an expectation of God doing something great. And we know several things about communion. Is One thing is it reminds us that Jesus is the Lamb of God. It reminds us that our sins are forgiven. And 
that oftentimes escapes us, what that really means, because we don't talk about it a lot. But what it does is it not only forgives our sins, it removes the final penalty. You remember the final penalty for sin, don't you, is death. And not just natural death, it's eternal death. It's eternal death that God in Revelation chapter 20 talks about, Isaiah talks about it, Jesus talks about it, that it's that final separation between the holiness of God and sin. And I want everyone to know that in the way I see heaven and hell, hell's a choice. You have to choose to be there. God sent Jesus to keep us out of it. Amen? Amen. And so I believe God is doing His best to keep everybody out of it. And that's His department, isn't it? And so God doesn't want anybody there. That's what John 3.16 says, that He wants everybody saved. So what God is doing in the world, and we can't see it all, we see about an iceberg. We see just a little bit of the tip. That God is moving throughout the world to save the world. And by the way, that's His job, isn't it? Our job is to live the gospel, and our job is to share the gospel. That's our calling. So they were to eat, standing up, expecting God to move. And so they were to kill the lamb, then they were to roast the lamb, they were to eat the lamb. Ew. Now when you read John chapter 6, it takes on a little different meaning, because Jesus says, you've got to eat of my flesh and drink of my blood, or you'll have no life in you. And so he could be directly um, pointing to the Passover lamb. So that makes sense. But what it does, though, is it calls us that John, when he said, Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world, he changed the script. He changed the script from a political Messiah to a king Messiah. A king that also is the priest. The king that is also the prophet. The king that is everything combined. And so when John said that, Behold, the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world, we see that two disciples followed him. We don't know which two. It just says that two followed him. What we do know in John chapter 10, 11, the claim that Jesus makes is, I am the good shepherd. Amen? Amen. I am the good shepherd. I like that. I like the 23rd Psalm. We should read it more than just at funerals. That it's a very, very compassionate and comforting song. song. But what we have to look at in John chapter 10 is we read on a little bit farther. I am the good shepherd because the good shepherd lays down his life for who? The now we got the connection. Not only am I the shepherd, I'm willing to lay down my life for my sheep. So again, Isaiah says, he was like a lamb to the slaughter. And if you remember anything I said last first Sunday of the month in August, I told you there were four words that will help us Remember the significance of communion. These four words are taken from the Last Supper. And if you remember, the four words are take, eat, drink, and remember. And I'm using them as a verb, not a noun. Because a verb means action. You're supposed to do something. And it's very easy to remember when, when we're thinking of the Lord's Supper and communion to take, eat, drink and remember that when we take we are taking something that was provided for us that we didn't spend anything on it it was given unto us something of value and the value is simply that Jesus is the best God's God 
Anybody want to say amen to that? Amen. He's the best gift God's got. And God makes it so important that in the Scripture, He uses the words, My only begotten Son. This is the only thing I treasure, is my Son. How about you and your children? Do you treasure your children? Do you treasure your children? Would you trade them off for anything, even when they're acting up as teenagers? No. No. They're more valuable than anything, right? They're without cost. So God has given us Christ. And when He said, take, as I said last month, is it a commandment or an invitation? Well, I think it's both. I think it's a commandment because it's part of saying yes to Jesus. But it's an invitation because you have to say yes. You have to say, I want to believe. There's nothing in this world that can make you believe on Jesus Christ. Nothing. We know there are people who say they believe, but they don't. Judas was one. Judas was one that started off good, but he ended up bad. Somewhere along the line, he said, I'm done. I'm out of here. I don't believe on him anymore. He's not it. Part of that reason is probably because Jesus didn't fit the script. He would finally rejected him because this isn't how it's supposed to work. And so we take from God something that was provided by Him of great value. And then when we eat, we eat of the bread. And remember what Jesus said of the bread. That He said, take and eat, for this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When we think about the bread, and I mentioned this last um, Communion Sunday. Which is more important, the bread or the one who gave you the bread? Just something to think about. Jesus makes that point several times in Scripture. Which is more important, the gift or the one who gave the gift? Good question. Then when we drink, we drink as we have discovered not only the importance of water, but the importance in the Christian sense of it's the blood that washes away sin. It's the atonement, as to speak, the Lamb of God. Remember, they were to take the blood and strike the lentils and the posts, nothing on the threshold. No one. The Hebrew writer in chapter 10 talks about don't trample the blood of Jesus underfoot. No blood on the threshold, but it goes what? All around you. Isn't that wonderful? So we drink. And what did Jesus say? This is my blood of the new covenant. As often as you drink, you do this in remembrance of me. So that brings us to the last one, which I think is the most crucial, is remember. Two times Jesus said, and Paul reiterates it in 1 Corinthians 11 chapter, that every time we eat of the bread... Every time we drink of the cup, we do show the Lord's death, and we also show He will return. Isn't that comforting? That not only am I forgiven to live a life free from sin before God, Jesus says He's coming back. Jesus says He's coming back not only to this world, but He says we're all going to sit down we're going to have um, a big dinner, and I'm going to serve you. And somebody told me, or I've heard several people argue, that they don't know if it's going to be barbecued ribs or barbecued brisket. And I, I, I guess they were from Texas. But uh, Jesus said, I'm going to come, and when I come, we're all going to sit down, and we're all going to have a meal, and I'm going to serve you. Wow, one more time to be served by Christ. But we remember, we remember, and that is so wide open, remember what? I'm thinking of a song, I remember when my burdens rolled away. Anybody ever hear that one? They troubled me night and day. Well, anyway, that's, that's the end of, yeah, that's the end of my song, all right? <laughs> How about at the cross, at the cross where I first saw the light? You know that one? Okay, that's better. <laughs> 
Anyway, but to remember. I want to put you in remembrance of what? Well, that's between you and God. And so it is with that, let us move into communion.